Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. We are here to spoon-feed it to you. All right, let's take a quick look ahead at everything we covered from last week. If we can scan faster, then people don't need to stay still for as long. This might matter for pediatrics. From the second article, we're not perfect. Admitting as much could bring you some wellness. And then the physiology of right heart failure to help us all diagnose and treat it. After that, ASEP weighs in with new clinical policy statements on acute heart failure. And they're pretty good, too. And then finally, dexmedetomidy. Not something we talk about much here, but we'll go over some of the finer points of its use. Now, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber. What's the deal? And so you're not receiving the full Journal Feed podcast. You're only receiving a portion of the past week's articles. Don't worry. Uh, all the articles are good, so you're still getting good articles. But if you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember that we don't ever want anyone to think that money is a barrier to them giving the best patient care possible. And so if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, please just get in touch and we can help out. And this is the audio version of the past week summaries, all of which you can find up on the blog. And this week we're brought to you by Jason Lesnick, Gabby Leonard, Laura Murphy, Seth Walsh Blackmore, and Clay Smith. So without further ado, we bring you the first article titled Impact of Faster Computed Tomography Scanner on Sedation of Pediatric Head Computed Tomography Scans in Two Large Emergency Departments, a retrospective study out of the Journal of Pediatric Emergency Care. Doing scans on kids is something we try to minimize as much as possible, and one of the reasons for that is that it's scary for kids. Not all of them understand exactly what's being done, and they don't necessarily understand that they have to hold still. If the kid moves, causing too much motion artifact, then the scan's pretty much no good. And we don't want to have to scan anybody more than once, so not so infrequently we have to sedate young children. There are risks to sedation though, so the less we have to do that, the better. If we could do the scans faster, then, I mean, the kids wouldn't have to hold still for as long, and so in theory, we would, wouldn't have to sedate as many children. This study was a retrospective review from two emergency departments, which included 15,000 patients after new CT scanners were installed in those emergency departments. This meant that the imaging time for head CTs dropped from 12 seconds down to just 2 seconds. After this change, they found that there was a statistically significant decrease in the percentage of patients who needed sedation to complete a head CT. It wasn't really an enormous difference, just a drop from 8.4% down to 75 but that's a difference nonetheless. Patients that did require sedation had a slightly longer length of stay, an average of 37 minutes. Now, the most frequently used medication was midazolam. That didn't change before or after. But after the new CT scanner was put in place, there was significantly less use of propofol. It actually surprises me just a little bit. I think that propofol would be a pretty good medication for this kind of indication. It's really quick on, quick off compared to midazolam that's going to sedate people for a little bit longer. And of course, you wouldn't have to give that much either. You just have to give them enough so that they hold still for literally two seconds. All in all, with these new scanners, there was a pretty minor change. But the less kids that have to be sedated, I'd say no matter what, the better. Especially since kids that need to be sedated are significantly younger than other kids. Here, the average child that needed to be sedated was two years old compared to seven years old for those who did not need sedation. In a spoonful, faster scanners meant less sedation for CT scans of the head in a pediatric emergency department population. That's a good change in my books. So if you ever have the choice between a new faster scanner and an old one, I mean, take the new one. Okay, we're going to skip on over to the third article. Titled, Right Heart Failure, a Narrative Review for Emergency Clinicians out of the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. The right ventricle is very much the less loved ventricle. But I'm telling you that just as much blood passes through it every minute as the left ventricle, and so it's just as important. Patients with right heart failure teeter on the very edge of their physiologic bounds. So understanding that balance is important to diagnosing and treating these patients. 
There are three main reasons why the right heart fails. Muscle dysfunction, elevated pulmonary pressures, and volume overload. The most common causes are going to be left heart failure causing the right heart failure, followed by chronic lung disease, thromboembolism, and then pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, the right heart is just weaker than the left, so it's going to be more sensitive to physiologic stresses. An acute failure of the right ventricle, it becomes very preload dependent to, in order to maintain its stroke volume. But there's a limit. Volume overload leads to right ventricular over distension, and this will cause bowing into the left ventricle, which will decrease cardiac output from that side as well. And you kind of need both sides. Both sides are interconnected. We call this ventricular interdependence. Now, this is why we often say that the right ventricle, quote unquote, falls off the starling curve. Function of the right ventricle actually gets worse with volume overload. Unlike the left ventricle, well, I'm not saying that can necessarily keep up with an infinite amount of fluids, but it still kind of maintains its output for the most part. Treatment of right heart failure has to target the cause, while optimizing hemodynamics and oxygenation. Focus is going to be your good, good friend in assessing the right ventricle and helping determine volume status. Be real careful about volume status, I just explained why. Hypovolemia is not good because, as we said, we need to support the stroke volume, but hypervolemia obviously isn't good either. Get your ultrasound probe out and have a look at the right ventricle and the IVC, and then think about using small boluses. We're talking like 250 cc's at a time. Have a low bar for vasopressors in hypotensive patients. Dibutamine or milrinone might even be needed for inotropic support. Now, do I need to tell you that hypoxia and acidosis are bad? Probably not, but I'll do it anyways, because these things are bad. Both hypoxia and acidemia, as you may recall, cause pulmonary vasoconstriction, and that will increase afterload, making the right ventricle work even harder. Remember that the number one cause of right heart failure is going to essentially be that afterload when the left ventricle fails. Now, you can reduce afterload with pulmonary vasodilators, like nitric oxide or phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Okay, back to hypoxia. You may be very tempted to intubate these patients, but you should avoid it if at all possible. Right heart failure is essentially the poster child for peri-intubation arrests. High flow nasal cannula and non-invasive ventilation should be done and done as much as possible and probably as soon as possible. If you absolutely must intubate, then don't be shy with the vasopressor support prior to intubation and try not to bag these patients. Put them directly on the vents so that you can minimize plateau pressures and peep to maintain your preload. And the last point that I'm going to say is that arrhythmia is causing right heart failure. I mean, reach for cardioversion early. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers can worsen cardiac output, and you just don't need that. Okay, that's it. In a spoonful, respect the right ventricle. You have to know how to dance with her because she's a very unforgiving partner. Okay, that's all the articles that we have for you this week. Let's wrap that up. So what did we learn? First, uh, Faster scanners, even by just 10 seconds, still makes a difference in pediatrics and means less sedation is needed. Then from the third article, the right ventricle is a fickle mistress. Show her the love and attention she deserves. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where the newsletter is the best way to make this podcast into a bite-sized nugget of space repetition. Now, if you're feeling a little bit of FOMO, you're thinking, hey, I only heard two articles, I'd sure like to hear five, then you'll have to join us over in the members feed. Our goal here is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding. And so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.